Welcome, Truth Seekers, to Paranormal M. Get ready to explore the realms of the supernatural with us. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications for a front row seat to our most intriguing stories. Dealing with the supernatural from the perspective of a chaplain. I'm a chaplain for a community church. I deal with many things. One of the aspects of my role is dealing with the spiritual world. I'm specialized in dealing with what we call spiritual warfare, demons or dark spirits. I've only recently come across this Reddit, but I've read a lot of the posts now, and I see a lot of the same themes coming up. I haven't given out the same advice to many different posters. Thought it might be helpful to do a quick do's and do nots. Keep in mind, I'm not trying to convert or evangelize, excuse me, evangelize you. But it's better to know what options you have. My advice will both be Christian and general information, and comes from a place of study and lifelong interaction with the spiritual world. First, what is a chaplain? A chaplain is a church minister, a representative who works in the community, or in the secular, non-religious world to give mental, physical, or spiritual advice. The advice is often non-religious, though the chaplain is religious. Chaplains will use all of the tools in their toolkit to help someone, which includes counseling, referring to health services, or engaging in religious support like prayer, blessing, or protection, with the person if they're willing, on behalf of the person when they're not present if they're not willing. The best verse to describe a chaplain is always be prepared to give an answer to those who ask you to give a reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Let's get into it. Signs of haunting. Always look for the scientific or rational explanation first. Never first assume it is spiritual, unless you have the inexplicable. And search hard for logical reasons for signs. Tick all of the boxes in order to be certain. This is a big category. Not be able to fully cover this. There will be some stuff missing, but here's the general signs I've seen in person. Foul, inexplicable smells. Footsteps. Scratching. Knocking. Temperature fluctuation. Whispering. Feeling of being watched. Inexplicable movement of items. Small visible movements like pulling on blankets or knocking items over. Physical touching, as in being touched, poked, prodded, grabbed. Sleep paralysis. More on this below. Haunting of an individual. This is much more difficult and very complex. NB. This is really difficult to ascertain. Sometimes it's purely psychological or a mental health issue. Need to get professional psychological intervention first, and then spiritual. A complete change in attitude and behavior. Growling or groaning for no reason. Sudden memory loss with no reason. Inexplicable anger and mood shifts. Hostility to spiritual practice or people. Foaming at the mouth. Sudden substance abuse. Standing and staring for long periods of time. Addictions. Dangerous slash self-harming attitudes and behaviors. If it knocks or calls, do not answer. One of the most common beliefs across religions and beliefs is that dark spirits or demons require permission to possess a person or an area or to tether to somebody and haunt them. But this permission doesn't always need to be explicit. Dark spirits are infamously tricky. Knocking on something and having it open for you is the most simple and most common form of invitation there is. Like being let through someone's front door after knocking, the invitation is implicit. They'll also do things like imitate loved ones or target children. That's mostly because children have an incredibly active imagination. Not to worry you, but sometimes an imaginary friend is not so imaginary. Although most of the time it is. It's just a child engaging in play, imagination, and creativity. But if it calls to you or knocks, 
My suggestion is always to rebuke. Rebuke and ward. My rebuke is, I do not permit you, you are not welcome here. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I command you to leave. For non-religious rebuking, obviously, take out the in the name of Jesus stuff. Warding is when you put crosses or protections on doorways or regular blessings and cleansings. Non-religious warding would be making sure to shut and even lock all the doors. Never under any circumstance try to communicate with these spirits. Some spirits are benevolent, but if it is trying to trick you, it is evil and has to be rebuked. Some examples I've seen have been knocking on windows, porch doors, walls, bedroom doors, or even front doors, or pretending to be a loved one calling out to elicit a come here. All of these instances require strength, courage, and firm words. Sinister spirits love fear, so find whatever it is that bolsters you and use it. Obviously, for me, it's Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. White sage is not a cure-all. So often we see people advocating for the use of white sage, but this can be a bit of a misnomer. White sage is a Native North American practice. Dark spirits respect authority. We don't know why. There are many theories, but for whatever reason, the spiritual world respects authority. If you are not Native American, and you wave white sage around to cleanse a house, you will not fully do so, because you don't have the authority to practice. It's also because white sage is for certain kinds of cleansings, more responsive in nature, like somebody dying in a house. For an alternative example, as a Western chaplain, I will use frankincense and myrrh, and it's worked every time I've used it to cleanse a house or bless someone. When I was younger, I tried sage, and it worsened the symptoms of a haunting, hence the investigation into it. Dark spirits are angry and malevolent, and if you show you know that they're there, and they're trying to get rid of them, but don't actually get rid of them, you will anger them. My suggestion for a cleansing is to find a spiritual elder. A spiritual elder could be a chaplain from a local church, or it could be a shaman from the local tribe. Sorry, I'm from New Zealand, and tribe is the word we use. Either way, you need somebody with authority, who knows what they're doing. Don't try and fix these things alone by essentially kind of co-opting another culture and religious practices. You don't have the authority to do so. However, I will say, you can still rebuke. This point is incredibly important about the use of symbols, herbs, incense, and other cleansing rituals. You can still command something to leave you, and your house, or your family alone. Immature interaction with the spiritual world is hugely dangerous. Things follow you. The same old trope, but it's a trope for a reason. A seance in a graveyard, a Ouija board at a party, going to a haunted abandoned building in the night. All these things we love to do to scare ourselves. All of these things are intensely dangerous. Can't tell you how many times my support has basically been a spiritual investigation to find and solve a cause. If you know where it came from or what it's connected to, much easier to deal with a malevolent spirit. That being said, it's also one of the most common reasons I've seen for hauntings. People have invited the interest of a spirit with their silly behavior. It's not just worth the risk if you want to experience it. Experience it vicariously through videos and let other people take the risk. If you do muck around, you know what I'm going to say. Find yourself a chaplain or a spiritual leader. Get yourself and your living environment blessed. Rebuke and ward. Of course, my first suggestion is to, you know, don't muck around with it. Also, to cover here, things like living on native burial grounds, haunted forests, or graveyards all require specific interventions. You need to know the problem. For example, living on a native burial ground or a battleground, a grievance has occurred, and there are angry spirits. Anything to do with the wrongdoing toward the native population requires native reconciliation, ritual, and intervention. Benevolent spirits. These definitely exist. 
you will find conflicting information surrounding benevolent spirits and what to do with them. But personally, my suggestion will be to move them on. Sometimes they are malevolent spirits, up to no good in tricking you, though sometimes they are the spirits of loved ones. However, they don't belong here anymore. Grief can be a powerful tool. So, too, can love. If you think it's truly the benevolent spirit of a loved one, then if you love them, let them go. Give them peace and freedom. Bless them and cleanse the environment. Magic slash witchcraft. As a Christian chaplain, my job is to tell you to avoid this. However, the reality is, is that plenty of people engage in this area of the supernatural perfectly safely. If you are Wiccan or a determined practitioner, my only request is that you find someone in your faith to mentor you. So that way you can do it safely. People messing around in witchcraft without having an elder to guide them is another horrendous, dangerous way to invite malevolent spirits. And I admit the same can be said about many Christian practices. Sleep Paralysis or Supernatural this is probably the most common question I see, but there is a relatively simple answer. Is there anything else going on other than the sleep paralysis? While sleep paralysis can be terrifying and a tool of dark spirits, sometimes it is simply sleep paralysis. Sleep paralysis is when your conscious and subconscious have not fully reconnected. You're awake, but you're not physically in control. Supernatural occurrences usually bring in a whole raft of other things, unable to sleep because it feels like you're being watched. Other telltale signs of a haunting, like light switches turning on and off in the night, footsteps, temperature fluctuations. If you're not sure, my suggestion is to sleep on your side as often as possible. If it's sleep paralysis, it'll still happen. If it's supernatural, it will stop, because you can no longer easily be pinned. The most single helpful piece of advice. Be courageous, and remember that fear and anger are the same emotion with different responses. Current evidence indicates that they're from the same part of the brain. The purpose for many cultural war dances was to turn fear into anger. For Christians, it's a lot easier, any faith practitioner really. For me, when I'm confronted with something spiritual, I stick to my go-to. I do not permit you. You are not welcome. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I command you to leave. If you can't muster the ability to be clear, logical, and concise, then I honestly recommend you get angry and let it be known. How fucking dare this thing come into your house and fuck with you? How dare it follow you around and make your life harder? Tell it to fuck off. Another incident happened. So this has just happened an hour ago, and I just wanted to share it with someone. So I was in my bedroom with my wife, doing the normal kiss goodnight before I went to play video games. Nothing was off, and my wife kind of fell asleep shortly after. Came back into the bedroom to find these two and a half foot long sparklers like fireworks. They had been laying on the top of my hamper on the side of my bed all laying over the bed, on top of my wife, and who was sleeping, all around her, but all on the bed and the package as well. I woke her up and asked her what the fuck she was doing with the fireworks. She mumbled half awake that she didn't do anything and it wasn't her. So I started putting them away and I really wish I had taken a picture, but I didn't think anything of it till I had to put them away already. The only way they could have been sprawled out over the bed like that is if somebody threw the box onto the bed or like shook them out all over. I went back to playing video games and looked down and noticed I hadn't missed a call from my wife's phone. Rather, they had missed a call from their wife's phone, but no voicemail. I asked her why she called me and she said she didn't. She usually recalls the next morning if she called my phone because I'm being too loud. It's only the next room, and I know it can be loud sometimes. The same night I was joking, saying that the ghosts were blowing my money around. We were playing Monopoly, and I think I may have pissed something off. I just came to bed now and questioned her again about it. She didn't remember anything. 
but even fully awake she didn't know anything about the sparklers and kind of looked stunned for a second herself for a second. This is only the newest of many strange things that have happened in this building. It's a 120-year-old building that used to be an old secret society building. I hear boot prints in the ceiling. I've seen shadows. I've been grabbed physically by my face, ankles, and shoulders before here. I just want to leave this place. I've lived here for like eight years and so many things have happened, but it's not just this place. I've experienced things my whole life. I think partially because my mom's a pastor, and partially because these things follow me wherever I go. I can't escape it. I can't get away from the paranormal if I tried. I've seen over ten exorcisms and more experiences where I live than a normal person. I haven't been given a choice to believe in these things or not. Some people go their whole lives without experiencing anything. Others aren't so lucky. I wish I could just live a normal life, but these things follow me either through my life or through what my friends are going through, and they ask me for help. My Haunting of Living in an Odd Fellows Hall Starting with my personal history, my mother is a Christian pastor. However, my mind is open to all sorts of things. I believe in angels and demons, beings from other dimensions, cryptids. I just look at everything with an open mind ever since I was little. My mom said before I was even conceived, a pastor told her that, well, going to have another child. She believed she was too old for a child and scoffed it off, thinking he was just crazy when he told her that. Isaac was coming. Biblical background, Isaac was the son of Moses and Sarah. His wife was too old to conceive a child, yet she did anyway. I've had multiple pastors prophecy over me saying I was going to do great things and be a leader someday. I still think they're all crazy. But I feel this may have at least have to do with something with my sensitivity towards the paranormal. All my life I've had many experiences Good, but mostly bad. And I just feel the need to share them with people other than my family. If you want more information, just ask. I'll tell you. I'll share some of my shorter experiences with you in the future. But for now, the biggest and most intense story is of where I currently live. I try not to talk about, right, or research about the things that I've experienced as they tend to stir things up even more. Even as I write this, I get a feeling up of dread, and I hear cracks and bumps on the wall. But I just need to share this with other people. I want to post this something before I lose any more details of things I've experienced in this place. I moved into my apartment with my soon-to-be wife in 2016. We got married in 2017. With her brother, because we couldn't afford the rent by ourselves, still being young adults. It was awesome to finally have a place to our own without the constant parent breathing down our necks. My landlord shared the history of this building with me when we moved in about how this building was a building of an old, old fellow's hall. Odd fellow's. I found later it was built in 1885 and I didn't really do any research on my own until things started to happen. Everything was fine for a while and I can't remember really when all the things started happening but I do remember when I first felt the heaviness in the air and dread. There's one room in particular that felt more heavy and darker than the rest. The room where my brother-in-law slept. He never used to recall seeing or feeling anything paranormal, but he did used to sleepwalk and act very strange late at night. Now he has had many concussions from his time playing hockey, and I'm almost certain that that's where all this is coming from. He had some weird episodes, but I'm contributing them to his concussions. Well, in his room is where the weird stuff, or at least feelings, would start. When we would be in the kitchen, you could see straight down the hall into his bedroom. But sometimes it looked like it was pitch black in there, like a veil of darkness. The only way I can explain it, really. Like it felt like someone was standing in the doorway just watching you. Mind you, I've had this feeling before because I've always felt and been sensitive to this stuff. I don't know why. 
Well, after a while, I would try and just keep the doors closed to his room so I wouldn't get that feeling and it helped for a while. In my kitchen, there's a door-to-door -door storage room where I had a fly tying station set up because I'm a huge fishing and fly fishing fan. When I'd tie flies in there late at night, I'd always leave at 3 a.m. I always have been nocturnal. And that's because I would always start to feel uneasy and get the same feeling I would from my brother-in-law's room. Now, one time that made me think it wasn't just me is when my cat at the time came into his bedroom with me when I had a dark, heavy feeling. I entered his room, the cat with me. My hair stood on end, like I shouldn't have been there. I looked at my cat and his hair was on end as well. So I know I wasn't the only one feeling it. I closed the door, said a prayer, and left my bedroom. One of the most intense nights, I was up late playing video games like I always do. Can't remember the time, but it was after 2 a.m. My animal started looking at my apartment door. I heard rustling around out there, and so did they. Kind of like when my wife is home and she's getting ready to come in, but she was in bed. That's when I started hearing scratching outside my door. My lights inside the room I was in started flickering. I shit you not. I then saw my dog and my cat simultaneously watching something on my ceiling go around in circles. As I typed this, I heard footsteps from my attic. Just thought I'd add that in here. And this ties into something that I'll share in another post. After I got freaked out by my animals watching something that's not there, not fly, not a bug or anything, I was sitting on my couch watching this. That's when all of a sudden I had what felt like two hands grab my face from behind, pulled my head into the couch. As the hands were on my face, my whole face went numb and pale like no blood was in my face anymore. It's the only way I can describe it. After that, I started a prayer harder than I ever have. I don't go to church, and I'm not super religious, but I do believe in my faith and I know I have power over that stuff. I don't remember anything else happening after that other than a heavy feeling in the air. I ran to bed with my wife and explained what happened to her. We prayed and went to sleep. The next morning I found, outside of our apartment, handprints, scratches on our walls. The landlords painted it all over when we moved in. Wouldn't be the type to smear up what they did with dirt. So it's very odd that these would appear after the night I heard something outside. I'm going to try to attach pictures here, never posted on Reddit before, so I'm not sure if this will work. Hand and fingerprints on the ceiling and wall, the scratches on the wall in the hallway outside our apartment were right where our neighbor's head lay on the inside of the wall in his bed. I know this because he showed me once. I went in to look at furniture he was giving away. I never thought to ask him if he experienced anything because I didn't want to freak him out. Although I regret not asking. I wish that's where this ended, but it's not. One other instance is when me and my wife were in bed together, just reading and whatever we were doing till we fall asleep. I like to play my switch, but I felt the heaviness again. But what's weird is as soon as I felt it, she looks at me and told me she was scared, like something was in the room. I felt it too. This was the most I've ever been scared. Felt like something entered our room and started coming toward the foot of our bed, with ill intentions. I was so scared my body was literally shaking and I could barely even mutter a prayer. Like when you're in a dream and you try to tell but nothing comes out. I prayed long lines of, you are not welcome here. We are children of God and we are protected by his stripes. You are not allowed here and you cannot hurt us. Get out. I struggled to even get those words out, but I just continued to pray for a peaceful night's sleep. I'm actually starting to tear up while writing this. This was the most terrified I've ever been in my life, but I didn't want to tell my wife that. That was about the end of the worst of it. Granted, weird stuff still happens, and weird things still make sounds. We'll hear someone with boots walking around in our attic. We see shadows peek around the doorway to the hallway that you can see our brother's room from. It's connected to our living room. Sometimes the shadows are white. Sometimes they're black. 
Sometimes I get a weird feeling in the room I got grabbed in. I know it's time to go to bed. I try not to stay up past 2 to 3 a.m. anymore. My brother-in-law since moved down and his wife's sister now lives with us. We've gotten phone calls from her where she said she saw a white shadow move past the living room doorway in the hallway and other shadows. We're looking to move this summer. Not because of these things, but we've outgrown our apartment. We need a yard for our dog to run around in. But I will miss this place. As fascinated as I am with the paranormal, I would never want to live with the things I've lived with. Now I have done some research on my building. It was built in 1885 and was an old Oddfellows Hall. And what I actually found is, well, they used to involve skeletons with their initiations. A lot of people who've lived in it or bought old halls have found old literal skeletons in their closet or in the walls or floorboards. I'm starting to think there may be old remnants of skeletons somewhere in this building or some kind of portal they opened and never closed. The attic above us is constructed in a way where the ceiling is rounded off like that of a church or something with a raised platform at the front of the room like it was a stage. Old chandeliers hung from the ceilings. The attic is kind of locked up now as the landlord's son used to part up there literally four days in a row every weekend. We complained, so now no one is allowed up there. I would take some pictures. I do unfortunately have more stories outside of this place I have to share, one of which was at my old house where I grew up. The place was built just before I was born, so there's not really anything having to do with it being old or anything. But me and three other people all saw the same thing in my bedroom. Details and all. With me not telling any of them what I experienced, all I the same bedroom. I believe they meant in the same bedroom. My experience as a residential mover. I own and operate a mover's company. On many occasions, we're sent to homes where the owners have passed away. The homes are older than a hundred years of furniture have been passed down many generations. On one move from Texas to a 250-year-old home in Virginia, the house was renovated to look like it did when it was built. Small ceilings, visible beams, and the hardwood floor was original. The new owner even showed us bullet holes on the outside of the house dating way back. We arrived around 4 p.m. and the older told us where we wanted all the furniture. Then he left and we got to work on loading. Right off the bat, we felt very uneasy in this home. It was surrounded by mountains and trees. The nearest neighbors are about a mile away. There were three of us. I was inside laying rugs before the other two brought in furniture. It got dark quick as the sun went behind the mountains. I heard footsteps on the second floor and figured it was one of the guys going to, you know, working on the bathroom. When I walked outside, the two guys were coming in with the headboard for a bed. I asked if they were upstairs, and they both said that they were taking a smoke break while I lay rugs. He shrugged it off as just the house being old. It is now pitch black outside, and the house is a historic monument to the city meaning you can put so and type the doors and locks and knobs. Hmm. We were basically working with flashlights and candles with how low luminance the house lights gave. They wrote lemon scents. We all assembled in the living room area when we all hear a door slam at the back of the house. We figured it was a draft, but went to check it out anyways. These doors are original and easily weigh 80 to 100 pounds each. We all start to feel unsettled as I told them about the footsteps earlier. We start to unload the truck and assemble the place, all the furniture, as fast as we can. Once we got upstairs, the mood changed drastically. We all felt very nervous, as if we were all being watched. While assembling a bed frame from the corner of my eye, I would see shadows going back and forth. All of a sudden I hear a loud bang downstairs. Went to look and it was my drill I had left on its side on a table that fell to the floor. 
We all rush outside for a cigarette, see what needs to be finished to leave quickly. All that's left is the footboard of the bed I was assembling, and to take an armoire to the second floor. We plan accordingly, and we're in and out within 20 minutes. There was no way somebody could have come into the property because the owner had motion lights placed on the trees all around. And they only came on when we were outside, and the homeowner was in a hostel, or a hotel, 45 minutes away where I left him his keys. It's been about three years since that job, and we still talk about it to this day. Had weird supernatural or paranormal experiences that I can't explain rationally. First instant. So a few days back, I was in a bus going back home. An ambulance passed us by. I had the urge to cry out like ball out. So overwhelmed and had tears in my eyes, taking deep breaths to control my emotions. Couldn't explain it because one, I had nobody close to me die in my life yet. And two, no trips to the hospitals. Three, no emergencies that involve ambulances. I've passed through many ambulances in the past. I've always prayed that the person, whoever's in the ambulance, was safe. But such feeling never occurred. The second instance, yesterday night, my roommate's perspective. I was sleep-talking. Very normal for me. And she was asking me to stop it, thinking I was awake. And I did stop talking, apparently. The same thing repeated two to three times again, and it stopped. Then I gasped loudly like inhaled and didn't exhale for at least a few seconds. She said she could see my chest physically rise when inhaling and fall when exhaling. I even called my mom as if crying for help. She called me many times, and after a little time I replied, I'm okay, I'm okay. I went back to sleep. In my perspective, the moment I heard her call my name desperately, I felt like something or someone was standing near the leg side of the bed. It was completely black, and as far as I could remember, the silhouette had two hands and two legs and one head. I waved my hand once in a way to make it go away, as if it would dissipate into the air, and I said, I'm okay, I'm okay, to my roommate and fell asleep. I remember feeling absolutely scared and terrified really desperate to just go away from that feeling. I remember getting goosebumps and telling myself it's nothing and I shouldn't pay attention to it. The next evening, today evening, we were talking about what exactly happened and she told me her side of the story. Even then, when I thought of what happened, I got goosebumps all over my body, got chills and heart was beating too fast. It's possible all of these are physiological reactions because I perceive the situation as scary, but just mentioning so I don't miss out on any details. These things have never happened to me before, so what are your thoughts on it? If it's in any help or has any relation to this, I usually do tarot, but haven't done it in a week or more. And these incidents have happened during the week I hadn't done any tarot. I don't do any other spiritual or paranormal stuff. I'm usually a very positive person, but have been stressed lately because of work. Experience from last night. Paranormal or pure coincidence? Last night I had one of the strangest experiences of my life. Let me give some backstory before I get into what happened last night. I apologize for the length, but it's kind of necessary to grasp the full picture. In 2009, I purchased my first home. Luck really seemed to be on our side, as my fiancé and I had been looking for a year and houses were flying off the market. In September of 2018, my mom's neighbor had gone into a nursing home. The house was listed for sale. There was an estate sale held in the home in December, in which my mom and I attended. I felt like they were asking way too much for this incredibly outdated house. March rolls around and the house still hasn't sold, but they dropped the price down a bit. My fiancé and I decided to make an offer. They countered and we accepted. Life was great. We were homeowners and had the best neighbors in the world. My mom and stepdad. It felt like such a blessing for us to have my parents next door. Especially since my fiancé and I have two young kids. They were ages one and six at the time. 
I also work opposite shifts of my fiancé, so if he needed to run to the store or whatever while I'm working, my mom or stepdad could come over and watch them for 20 minutes. They were there to help with every detail from doing a complete living remodel to borrowing us tools and whatever we needed. My stepdad would even help out with our lawn care, and my fiancé would help with their snow removal. December of 2020, my stepdad started getting sick. He had vertigo that wouldn't go away. His doctor prescribed him meclizine, and after weeks and weeks of it not going away, his doctor referred him to an ENT. The ENT was under the impression that he was suffering from Meniere's. A week or two after seeing the ENT, he woke up one morning unable to walk, so he went back to his doctor yet again. His doctor thought maybe he had a stroke in his cerebellum, so he sent him in for an MRI. The MRI unfortunately showed a tumor on his cerebellum the size of a large grape. They also found tumors on both the adrenal glands and one in his lung. The diagnosis was stage 4 adenocarcinoma. Three months to the day after his diagnosis, on 6 21 my stepdad passed away in the comfort of his home. With my mom and I by his side and holding his hand. I was there for the whole process between his hospital stay, rehab, and then finally him coming home on hospice. Stayed up with him the night it became clear that he was dying. I made all the phone calls to hospice and the family after he passed. I wrote every word of his obituary. Living next door, I was able to spend a lot of time with my mother to help her through the grief of it all since he passed. It's become very clearly evident that it was more of a blessing for my mom to have me next door than it is for me to have her next door. I should also add that within a few days of my stepdad's passing, I believe he sent me a sign. My fiancé and I were sitting outside, saw a hummingbird trying to feed from my sage plant that was blooming. I've never seen a hummingbird in the city I live in. It's just too busy. We're not near any wooded areas. In fact, we're a block away from a very busy road. My mom and stepdad used to live in the next city over. And live... Excuse me. And they live next to a huge field. And there were woods not too far from their house. She used to get hummingbirds frequently. My stepdad loved to watch them. When they moved to the house my mom is currently living in now... She tried for several years with the hummingbird feeder, and not once did she get one. So it was quite a surprise to see this one right after his passing. So here's where my current story begins. This past Tuesday was my one-year anniversary of my stepdad's official cancer diagnosis. My mom's been having a really tough week because of it. I think she's finally entering the anger stage of grief. On Wednesday, I was home with the kids. My fiancé works regular business hours, and I work nights, 12-hour shifts, three times a week. I have a really weird eating schedule because I keep odd hours to begin with. He came home from work a little after five like normal. I wasn't feeling right. Felt light-headed, kind of dizzy. I sent him out for food thinking I just needed to eat something because I had been up for about five hours and hadn't eaten yet. So we had dinner and I still wasn't feeling well. I was lying in bed at 3 a.m. and the whole room was just spinning. Starting to feel really nauseous and hit me that maybe I was having a migraine, but maybe without the headache. So I woke my other half up, had him get me an Imitrex because I couldn't focus on anything but the spinning at the time, let alone trying to walk down a flight of stairs to find some meds. Thursday I woke up still dizzy, but it was short-lived and went away after an hour or so. Here's where it gets really interesting. Friday I woke up and felt fine still. I was scheduled to work that night and needed to wash my hair and do all the things to get ready for my work weekend. I have pink and purple hair currently, and to keep the color from fading I wash it in cold water by draping my head under the faucet of the bathtub versus taking a freezing cold shower. So mid-hair washing, the world starts spinning again. I gracefully managed to stumble my way over to my mom's house because I knew she could help guide me through that maneuver that you do for vertigo. 
and she did. She offered me some meclazine, which is basically like dramamine. She still had some in her medicine cabinet for my stepdad when he was experiencing vertigo on a daily basis. So my mom proceeds to tell me that I can't go into work like this. I can't safely drive there. And I'm like, ah, crap, she's right. So I made the decision to call into work. About two hours later, I take her up on the meclazine offer. Knowing I had already called into work, so if I got drowsy, no big deal. I'm not going in. Around 8 p.m., I couldn't keep my eyes open any longer. Took a nap on the couch. I woke up with some strange dreams around 10 p.m. My fiancé was watching some serial killer documentary series that, well, probably explained my dreams. I woke up feeling overheated, decided to go out to our breezeway to cool off a bit and wake up. When I hit the stairs to my back entry, which also leads to my basement, something smelled weird, like it was burning. The smell was overpowering. I looked around and didn't see smoke anywhere, but started calling for my fiancé, worried that it was in the basement. Three steps down I could handle but not the 10 or 12 to go down to the basement while I was still dizzy and now feeling drugged out and drowsy from the med I had just taken. So he goes and checks out the basement, says the smell stops midway down the stairs. It's not coming from the breezeway or outside. We have several switches in this back entry, one that powers an outside light pole in our side yard, one for the light in the breezeway and one for the basement, and one that turns the power off and on to the garage which is always on because of the garage door opener. So he starts checking the switches, and the one for the power to the garage is hot. He runs back downstairs, flips the breaker to that switch, grabs a screwdriver to take the plate off, and the switch was frying. He says to me, Thank God you noticed this. Two hours later, this whole experience was kind of just weighing on my mind so heavily I really kept thinking it was such a good thing that I didn't go into work tonight because who knows how much longer he would have had. There was probably going to be an electrical fire starting. And that's when it hit me. I was home because I was having the same symptoms my stepdad was having from his brain tumor before he passed. Is this him warning me? Protecting my family and I? My fiancé replaced the switch this morning, and I think we'll be calling an electrician to come check everything else out. I've never in my life had an experience on this level before. I woke up today feeling about 80% better as well. I stood face to face with a Wendigo when I was seven. This happened when I was seven years old. I'm sharing because my older brother reminded me of it. Now I'm 24, and now I can't get it out of my head. This was very traumatic for me, because after this event, a bunch of other things started to happen. This is how it started. Growing up and now, I live in a haunted state. Lived five miles away from the most victorious haunted forest. Victorious? Hmm. My mom used to tell my brothers and I about what she would hear walking by the forest the murders that happen, and about how she used to see Pook Woodgies. Bueller. My older brother, 11 at the time, let's call him David, and I, a seven-year-old female, were watching TV in the living room. It was dark outside, must have been a new moon. If you were sitting on the couch and looked to your right, you would see the glass sliding door, which viewed the backyard. Mind you, it was an acre lawn, and tall trees lined the perimeter. I was tired and decided to get my ritual glass of milk before bed. That's when I stood up and saw what was glaring at me through the glass door. It was tall, taller than the fucking door. It was skinny in the torso, but its chest was broad. It was white with tall ears. I want to say it looked like the white version of Donnie Darko. I believe you mean the rabbit from Donnie Darko? I was about 15 feet from the glass door. I froze and it didn't move. It just kept looking at me. It couldn't have been anyone else because we lived in the middle of the woods. I started calling for my brother's name, but David wasn't answering me. It started to get louder. 
now calling for my mom, too. Her room was on the other side of the couch, so she was in there in a heartbeat. She looked at the back door, looked at David, then told me to just sit back down. Couldn't understand why I was the only one freaking the fuck out. Laid on the couch, facing away from the glass door, David puts a blanket on me, and we both fell asleep on the couch. Well, 2021, David calls me from jail. He's been in and out since he was 13. Or since I was 13. This is how the conversation went. David. Hey, can I ask you something? Me. What's up? David. Do you remember that night? Me. What night? David. That night where you were freaking out, we were young? Remember that tall, scary-looking shit that was in the back door? Me. I had a flashback of that night. David. Look, I had a dream about it last night. I wanted to tell you that I saw it too. I was too scared to do anything, and Mom saw it also. The conversation ended because he had only had so much time on the phone. I felt relief that I knew I wasn't just having a schizophrenic hallucination episode. But my body went numb from the memory of being so scared. I told my significant other about it. He's my best friend. They told me that I came face to face with a Wendigo and how he wasn't surprised because of the small country town I lived in. When I looked up what a Wendigo was, my heart sank. That's what I saw. Now I think about it every day. It's been a year since I was reminded of it. I believe it still follows me. I think I had a guardian. My siblings and I grew up in a pretty traumatic environment. When my oldest sibling, five years older than me, became a teenager, they became a very real risk to my safety. Their bedroom was right next to mine, and I was regularly threatened with things to be done to me in my sleep. One particular bad night, a figure showed up in my bedroom doorway. He looked like the guy from the movie The Green Mile, Michael Clark Duncan. He was massive and wearing overalls. I could see him as clearly as I could see anyone but no one else could. He freaked me out. My parents eventually had to get a beaded curtain from my doorway to make another sibling swap bedrooms with the oldest. But looking back as an adult, I think he was protecting me. When he was in my doorway, nobody ever came into my room. My volatile sibling would be calmer and their threats would fade. A couple of years ago, we had someone enter our home while I was asleep. I woke up to somebody opening my bedroom door. That night the figure reappeared in my doorway. Hadn't seen or even thought about him in years. But that night he was clear as day. I think this figure was there to protect me and help lessen the trauma I was subjected to as a child. My mom remembers me being so afraid of the figure in my doorway that I could always clearly describe him. Even now, 25 plus years on, I can see him clearly in my mind. I wish I wasn't so afraid whenever he showed up. A mate of mine in recent years said he was a poltergeist, and if my sibling had followed through in my threat, I would have seen real evil out of him. But I really don't know. My uncle smiled at his funeral. So this happened a few years ago. But first, a bit about my uncle, Paulinho. He was an alcoholic and died of cancer and was battling with alcoholism his whole life. He started drinking in his teens and this kept going and turned into an addiction. My cousin's life was pretty hard as my uncle neglected him through his infancy. Money was always an issue. My uncle developed throat cancer in his 40s and had to quit drinking to have a chance. He actually managed to stop drinking and smoking and fought the hell out of the cancer. He then went 20 years without drinking or smoking, until he developed a new cancer. This time he didn't have the strength to fight the addiction and died drinking and smoking. He was a loving man, funny and really helpful, but he was stigmatized within the family because of his addiction. I was living with him and my grandma at the time, and I was attending college in the city where they lived. My uncle used to help her as much as can't really walk. But he wasn't doing much since the disease came back and I picked up on taking care of her, alongside one of my aunts. 
I tried to be supportive for him, but I know how hard it was for him to deal with the addiction and the cancer again. I really cared for him. The worst was feeling everyone draw away from him as he was slowly dying. At the funeral, he was in the coffin in the middle of the room. More all around him. When the time came, people started talking about him and I couldn't keep my eyes off of him. He had a neutral look, but you could distinguish a sadness in his face, especially in his mouth. Everyone that spoke said good things about him, but they all mentioned his disease or the addiction or how it was hard dealing with that sadness of watching him go back to it. I wanted to speak only good things of him, but had no strength. But after my cousin spoke, his wife started talking and only said fun things about him. The times he helped her and how he was like a father that she never had. In some funny situations. It was the only time that I took my eyes off of him because the speech was so moving and because I was really representing him like his good nature. What I wanted to say but didn't manage to. When I looked back at him, he had a distinctive smile on his face. He seemed genuinely happy at her words and how everybody was laughing and remembering him in a good light. Not throwing any criticism or paying attention to his flaws. It really amused me, and I'm a big non-believer of life after death, but that is something I really can't explain. Wish I could say it was only my perception, because at the moment, but I genuinely saw a smile on his face, and then faded away a few moments later. Little kids are obliviously connected to the spirit realm. Around ten or so years ago, my little brother was about two years old, just learning how to speak and develop into the toddler stage. I was around 12 or so years old, being the oldest sibling, with my two middle siblings in between me and my youngest brother that I'm talking about here. We had a family party celebrating my birthday that year. An extended family was over for dinner and cake and presents, all sharing stories, watching the game on the TV, etc., then my mom and aunt decided to get out the old family album from when they were all kids and talk about old memories and share them with us kids who were not alive for it back then. They came across a few pictures of my late Uncle Chris who died before I was born of cancer. I was really close to my mom's siblings, my mom especially. I only ever heard stories growing up about him from my mom and other members of the family, but never got to meet him. My little brother certainly never met him and also barely comprehended or heard any stories or seen any pictures of him up to that point in his life, being only two years old at the time as well. My mom pulled out a picture of Chris in his graduation uniform. And before she could even start explaining the picture, my little brother looked at it, started smiling and laughing a little bit and said, Hey, it's Chrissy. Chrissy was the nickname given to Chris by some people in the family as well as his close friends back then when he was alive and not even what my mother referred to him as, even like talking to me growing up. And after he said that, my mom and aunt just looked at each other mildly creeped out at first, followed by amazement and a deep debate about how the hell that was possible, as well as my grandma coming in being very spiritual, like I bet him and Chris are good friends. That would just be like Chris too. I was confused as hell myself, not understanding how he recognized him without ever seeing him before. Being, like, young, two years old, he could barely even form coherent sentences the majority of the time. I also have quite a lot of stories with my younger sister, as well as a faint memory from my own childhood that all really convinced me of this theory further move. But I'm curious what other people think about this, or what other similar experiences people have. I'm honestly not sure what I saw. When I was small, I used to live in a big old house in a small village with my parents and my grandma. The house was at least like a hundred years old. We bought it from the local priests who had lived there before. Normally I didn't experience many scary things, just a few weird sounds maybe. I'd note that I've always been scared of the dark. Even now as a twenty-year-old grown woman, I hate being alone in the dark, and I write it off as this house. As a kid, I had nightmares and reoccurring dreams very often, and I still do to this day. 
And exactly because of this, since my bedroom used to be right next to my grandma's bedroom from the right and my parents' room from the left, I would always open the door to either room at night to feel safe by their small sounds and the TV light shining in. This night it wasn't that late, probably around 7 or 8 p.m. I was playing Smite on my laptop. The door to my grandma was closed, but the other side, the door to my parents' bedroom, was halfway open. From my desk I was sitting at, I could see straight into their room. It was dark inside. The parents weren't home yet, but I was expecting them to arrive any second. At one point I heard someone in the room, so I turned my head. I saw something move in there. It was this slightly glowing white figure that I mistook for my mom somehow. Without a thought, I said, Hey, Mom, but got no response. When I doubled back to check the room, it was absolutely still and dark inside. I freaked the fuck out and ran to my grandma's bedroom, but I never actually told anyone in my family what I saw. I was sure I was seeing things because looking at my laptop screen for too long, perhaps. Years later, we moved out with my parents and it was only my grandma left in that big house alone. She told me sometimes she would hear footsteps in her room going around in a circle when she was taking a nap in the late afternoon hours. But as soon as she opened her eyes, the noises would stop. Sadly, my grandma recently passed away, so I couldn't discuss this with her further. To be honest, I'm kind of uneasy thinking about going back to that house. We'll most likely sell it if we gain ownership. A Transplant Recipient's Encounters Back in the year 2012, I had a heart transplant. Ever since, on occasion, something strange would happen. Usually when I was about to do something I probably shouldn't be doing or mention the donor's name. May 2021 First time I noticed something weird was when I was lying in bed and the door to the office adjacent to my bedroom was closing by itself. It was slowly shutting and I dismissed it as the AC turning on or something like that. But I remembered that the carpet in the office has a lump in it and you have to apply a good bit of force to the door to get it over the lump in the carpet. I got up and searched my house to see if anybody was up. They were not. November 2022. After that, I was on the phone and I happened to be discussing the donor. Almost instantly after saying the donor's name, the lamp next to me started blinking off and on. This is strange, but I could chalk that up to a loose connection in the lamp. January 2021. 22, sorry. I was hanging out with my friends and they asked me to retell my story about the heart transplant. Shortly after, we were messing around and took a video. However, when we replayed the video, an orb goes across the screen and completely covers my friend's face. It's probably just dust. March 2022. Today I was working on my car out in the garage, and I had to get up under the car to pop the oil drain plug out. I was feeling lazy and didn't put jack stands under the car. Right as I was about to slide up under the car, a wrench falls off the top of the toolbox. The top of the toolbox has a rubber mat to stop tools from falling off. That was the last straw that made me make a post about this. I'm a complete skeptic when it comes to ghosts, but I thought you guys would at least find it interesting. Being grabbed after helping people on this sub. Even though professionally I'm a chaplain who deals with the supernatural, I'm surrounded by people who load and assume stuff about my experiences. I don't know who I helped that something seriously powerful attached to them, which is scary enough as it is. I try and dismiss this kind of stuff and my first rationalization was bugs, but I can't really ignore or dismiss it anymore. There's a room we're next to that I've written about. I still follow my practices, warding with prayer, crosses, incense, Bibles. But there's two spots of faltering. Number one. That's when I'm at my computer desk. My legs are up against the wall to the creepy room. 
Several times throughout the hours, I'm sitting at my computer and I feel a hand grab or slightly yank my foot. It's cold. It's also incredibly annoying. The other spot is when I'm sleeping and my legs is uncovered. I get small yanks as I'm falling asleep or some that wake me up. Same deal. Cold as ice. The briefest second. Really weak grab or yank and then nothing. I woke up with random scratches on my leg one morning. But I'm going to assume it was my dog. Anyway, just offloading and appreciate people reading this. My partner refuses to talk about it because he's terrified of the paranormal. I work in a church, and it's the creepiest place in the world. It's an old church, but not like cool old. It's not Victorian built in the 40s, but it's a community church in a poor area and we've seen some broken souls come through the doors. We're open to any and everyone. We're probably the most accepting church I know of, but this does result in a lot of sad stories. I'm a chaplain, but I don't force my beliefs on anyone. I'm not here to invent, excuse me, I keep screwing this word up, evangelize you. I work alone in the church often. It's a low-paying job. I'm the only full-time worker for the church, but I do it because my background is in working with kids and young people who are on a trajectory to join a gang. I have a degree in youth development, master's in community leadership, and I'm trained in institutionalized psychology and chaplaincy. I don't do it for the money. I have a belief that our church is either haunted or targeted by spirits because of the work that we do in the community. We're grassroots, humility is key, and we're not afraid of spiritual warfare, which mostly looks like counseling people who are scared, giving out food boxes to the needy, blessing new buildings or places of death, lots of different spiritual things. My belief is that as a consequence of the people we help and the things we do, we draw negative spiritual attention to ourselves. I got a video the other day. I don't want it to go viral. I'll get in trouble with my church. But it was the usual doors opening and closing themselves and heavy footsteps in the church area while I was alone. And all the doors and windows were closed. I work in a small chapel office off to the side. The main building is usually locked up tight for security reasons, even as a different alarm. So I recorded myself going through the building. I'm a Maori, a New Zealand native, so I carry a traditional weapon that is blessed, a patu. It's with me in a flax bag for blessing things. I can attach a photo of that too if people are interested. This video would be decried as a fake, and I'm only sharing here because I'm hoping I'll be believed. To break it down, this is on a Monday. Our church is cleansed every Sunday evening. I'm by myself in the building on Mondays. The door is two meters, and when I first see what's going on in the door, I kind of just get frozen with shock. And then try to lighten my heart with humor. I don't know. It was a weird response. I acknowledged that maybe an adult with small hands did this, and that the cleaners just kind of missed it. The reason I turned the camera around midway, though, is... Those doors swing both ways, and I wanted to catch if they swung strangely behind me or if I could catch anything. Possible Alien Encounter So, my mom, two brothers, sister, and I decided to drive to the Grand Canyon. It was beautiful, but quite terrifying. Anyways, my mom then suggested that we go to Page, Arizona to see Horseshoe Bend. She had went months prior. She wanted us to see it. So we arrive. It's cool, whatever. So that night after we see everything, my mom suggests we go look at the stars. Page is tiny. It's the middle of nowhere. Just desert and mountains for hundreds of miles. We drive to a secluded area where there's almost no light except for, like, the hues, I guess, of the streetlights of a bridge that wasn't too far away. And oh my god, it was astonishing. Never seen anything like it. About 20 minutes of messing around, my mom suggests that we drive to Horseshoe Bend. 
There's no light there other than the sign. It kind of shines up from the bottom so you can see it, you know? So anyways, we get out and are just standing near the car chatting. Whatever. At this point, we were probably there like 40 minutes. And when we first got there, we had heard a cricket. And since it was so silent other than us, we were trying to find it because it sounded close. Anyways, here's where it gets weird. My brother is sitting about 15 feet behind us on the sign. He climbed on top of it. And the other four of us are by my mom's car. My brother sees a shout like a shooting. Yells out. Oh, a shooting star, I believe they think. About 15 seconds later, me and my mom see another shooting star at the same time. She then says something along the lines of, I bet people see all sorts of crazy weird stuff out here. And as soon as she says this, the cricket stops making that noise. It's dead silent. We're all staring into the distance. There's a white light level to us, like somebody holding a phone flashlight, and it would turn off and then back on a few feet away. It was moving around in circles slowly. We were literally all hyper-focused on this thing. None of us even said anything. I think we were all thinking, what in the actual? I want to say we were staring for 20 seconds when we hear the car door open and slam shut. We all looked at each other and my brother said, What the fuck? Did that door slam shut? We're all baffled. I don't think any of us said anything. My mom walks up to the car and she's bending down looking into the car and my brother comes up behind her and shines his flashlight since he couldn't really see inside. And as soon as he did that, my mom screamed at the top of her lungs and took off running. He's in there. There's someone. Naturally, we all scream and we're like, what the fuck? Where are we running to? My oldest brother looked again and there was nothing. We got in and took the fuck off. We had chills and couldn't believe it. My mom was spooked as fuck and described it as a pale dude in her driver's seat, hands on the wheel. She couldn't make out any facial features, really. But to be fair, she was only peering in that window for about two seconds tops. We didn't stop talking about it all night. About an hour later, my mom, sister, and I were feeling bad and wanted to go back. Bros kind of said no, but finally said fine, but we're not getting out. We left the hotel, got to the car to go back, and as soon as my hand touched that car, I was overcome with a nasty feeling. Came out of nowhere, and I immediately started having a panic attack. Hadn't had one in years. My family was comforting me, and it weirded them out of... Weirded them out for show. We didn't end up going back. Husband and I realize we've seen it. To start with my real parents, they died in a car accident, and I got adopted from when I was around the age of four. I've always seen this tall, dark figure at the end of my bed or corner of the room in my dreams. It didn't have a hat or a brim. It was always darker than the room it was in. It happens about three times a week or if I go anywhere new or overnight. Each house I've lived in, I've seen it. If I go to a friend's overnight, then it would be there, too. I always thought it was just me being crazy and overthinking things. There was no way I could tell people, and I didn't want to come off as that weirdo who sees things. When I was dating my husband, I saw it at his, and didn't say anything. We're now married, and we have our five-month-old. Literally the other day, I told him I had a weird dream. I had a black tall thing coming up the stairs, opened the door and just started staring at me and our baby. He turned white. He said he had the exact same dream that night. We shared the same dream. Upon talking, he admitted that he had seen it for a while. He only saw it when he started dating me and obviously sees it often now in whatever house we're in. We've recently moved too, and he saw it the first night. In the hospital I gave birth in because of the big C word. My husband had to go home. And that was on his own, or sorry, he was on his own the very first night. 
I got moved to a ward, and the nurses would come check on myself and the baby, come do my blood pressure and just take care of you until the morning. I was going home the next day. I saw whatever it was just standing outside the curtain rail of the hospital bed watching us. One nurse came and took my vitals. I heard her gasp. She shoved on the lights, blinding me in the process. She apologized quickly and said that she had a long night and apologized again for blinding me. She did a full look of the room before she left and made sure to leave the bedside table lamp on. The weird thing that happened was the first night of me being out of the hospital and at home with her newborn baby. It was there in the corner. He said he saw it look at me and then look down and into the crib and then just turn to leave. I'm now currently scared because it's validating that something is following me. I don't think it's evil. I think it's watching over me. And now, our baby. And now, see ya.